I think most of you, most of you know who I am, um, but I'll probably take just a, a minute or two to kind of quickly walk through that for those of you that may be new here um, or, or haven't uh, seen this portion before. Um, so this actually isn't my day job. Um, I am still fully employed as a, as a data center architect. I work with uh, large scale service providers and design data centers um, around the globe. That's what keeps me traveling most of the time. Um, as uh, it was alluded to, I travel pretty much every week. Um, so last week I was in Saudi Arabia and this week I'm here and next week I'll be, I have no idea yet. I'll find out probably tomorrow. Um, so uh, it's, it's constantly moving. Um, outside of that though, I kind of my nights and weekends sort of thing is the blog. Um, it's been doing it now for a, a few years and I'll talk about that in a second. But beyond that, um, I'm also a triathlete. So me personally, I, I run, I swim, I bike. Um, I've done a, a number of races. Um, you know, I, I used to do Ironmans a few years ago. Um, I decided that it's, it's more fun to do things that are a lot shorter than that. Um, so I've been doing like 10Ks and 5Ks and um, some Olympic, Olympic distance races as well. Um, but uh, focusing on things that I can fit into my schedule. Um, I, I love to travel a lot. Um, even though I travel a ton for work, I still enjoy traveling outside of that for fun, um, especially with my wife. Um, and as part of that, um, as was alluded to a second ago as well, um, she owns a, a cupcake shop in Paris, and so part of my secondary or tertiary job is uh, tasting cupcakes and everything to do with that as well. So it's, uh, it's been a fun, a fun journey so far. Um, I do live in Paris, France. I um, moved there about two years ago. So I know the, the nickname is DC Rainmaker, um, but there was no way I was changing the domain name after I, I started to Paris Rainmaker or anything like that. So that's where it came from. Um, so the blog started about seven years ago um, in 2007. Um, it's best known these days for in-depth technology reviews. That wasn't really how I started off. I started off simply as a blog about my training and my first journey to complete my first Ironman. So it was like most other kind of personal blogs of, you know, here's, here's my life, here's what I ate, here's what I ran, um, kind of that, that sort of thing. About a year after that, I happened to write a, an email to some coworkers around uh, um, a sports watch at the time, the Garmin 4105, you know, the little orangey red um, watch that's um, very, very popular. And I decided to go ahead and copy and paste that email into the blog. And that, um, over the course of a couple months, became uh, somewhat popular as a review of um, the 305. And that then bloomed from there into the blog as it is today. Um, so now I get about uh, 2.8 million page views a month, um, about 1.2 million unique people a month, uh, depending on the month. So um, there's a few people that stop by. Um, that's on top of tens of thousands of um, subscribers that read it through uh, RSS and you know uh, Feedly and things like that. Um, and of course. Uh, there's also plenty of people that follow on Twitter and Facebook, um, and, I, and I continue to see growth. Uh, it's pretty much just about doubled since last year this time, so it's just it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's, it's fun to kind of start to touch new areas of sports technology that I'll talk about over the next, uh, I guess, hour or so. Um, just probably two things I want to clarify with this group, though, um, is how I, I make money, because I think it's really important. I think it's important to what I do is reviews um, on the blog. And the first thing is that I, revenue is based on affiliate links, which means that you know when people come to the site and they buy things, um, or come to the site and they read reviews and they go on to Amazon or other, other partners, they can buy stuff that way. Um, but I don't take any money from any of you in this room. So I don't allow you to advertise with me. I don't allow you to pay me to write posts. Um, all that kind of stuff drives me crazy. So um, for me, you know, there is advertising on my site, but it's purely through it's Google AdSense. So if you're looking at dishwashers, you'll see ads for dishwashers. If you're looking at um, women's underwear, you'll see ads for women's underwear. Um, I have no control over that except for blocking people. So I block just about everyone in this room. Um, so you know, if, if Garmin attempts to advertise with me, it's automatically blocked and it, I don't have to worry about it. So I, I like to be as impartial as possible. I don't want to take money from the people that I'm reviewing, um, and it makes it easy that way. Um, from a, a geography standpoint, um, about 45% of the readers right now are in the U.S. and Canada, um, and about 40% are in Europe, and the remainder is, is outside of that. Um, so a little bit in South Africa and Australia New Zealand are, tend to be the most popular, um, primarily just because it's English speaking. And then finally, who is the reader? Um, for, for me, the reader is, is everyone across a broad spectrum of people, so it's not just 
um, you know, sports uh, Ironman triathletes. Um, it's people that are going towards their first 5K. Um, it's people that are PhDs or aeronautical engineers that are looking at stuff that I'm doing um, and find interest in that. Um, it's Olympic gold medalist. It's uh, down to somebody that's trying to lose, you know, five, six hundred pounds in some cases. Really, really cool to see the journey and the story of, of you know, a whole bunch of different uh, people in different audiences. Um, it's also followed by a lot of financial analysts. That's actually one thing I've done a lot more in the last year is talking with um, uh, Wall Street firms around you know where I think technology is going. Um, so they look at a lot of what I talk about and kind of make their their predictions based on that um, for for those companies that are publicly traded. Um, and then of course mainstream media, um, whether it be the Washington Post or um, you know tech things like Engadget, Gizmodo, etc. And then um, some TV stuff as well. Um, and then finally, you guys, you read a lot of what I write. Um, I, I know that you all read what I write for about your competitors and about yourselves. Um, so you're, you're certainly a big part of that audience as well. So I want to do something a little bit different this year um, for at least the first uh, half or three quarters, which is talk to the, the connected watch. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of focus on that over the last, uh, I guess, three weeks or so, but even just last year in general. Um, there's a lot of new products that have come out of that marketplace. Um, some are products that you've never heard of, and some are products that everyone's heard of. Um, so I want to kind of go through a little bit about you know, how we got to where we are today with the connected watch um, and, and why that story matters as we go forward for the next few years. Um, so if you look at sort of this segment, there's always been kind of three basic categories of, of watches out there. There's been, you know, fitness watches. Those have been things, if you go back 20 plus years, um, like a polar heart rate monitor, right? Just a very basic fitness watch that somebody can go out there and, and time something with. Then there was kind of regular cheap watches. These are things you might find at Target or Kmart or Walmart or something like that. That's just a watch you wear, nothing fancy, just a watch. Um, and then you had those fancy high-end watches, right? The ones that um, the Swiss watchmakers and whatnot that um, are more style pieces than they are necessarily a, a purely functional thing. Um, and of course then what you found was that people that bought fitness watches tended to use those also for um, their day-to-day -day watch. And you, you see that a lot even today where people that will go and buy a fitness watch will use that as day-to-day. Um, but it wasn't really until the last decade that we started seeing a bit of a split there between a fitness watch and what's a day-to-day -day watch. And that's when, you know, 2005, 2006, we got GPS watches that were roughly the size of a Twinkie that you put in your wrist, um, and you went ahead and you ran with that, but you would never dare wear that in the office, right? That was something that um, was purely for running, and, and that was that. Um, over the course of the last, I'd say, four years or so, since about 2010, 2011, those watches got to the point where they're actually normal size. They're, they look completely like any other watch out there, um, and they're not this giant thing sitting on your, your wrist. Even triathlon watches, which have been historically very large and bulky, have gotten down to be normal size watches. Um, the you know, Sunto watch looks just like a regular uh, timepiece that you might find from another European um, uh, watchmaker. Then, of course, we started to get into data downloading, right? So if you went back 15 years ago, you didn't actually download the data. Um, you just looked at your watch and said, wow, I, I did something. Um, and that was that. And then we started downloading data, and it was it, via all sorts of strange different attachments. There was USB before USB. There was serial connect connectivity, and then there was IRDA, and all sorts of clunky things to get that data off that watch. Um, and it wasn't until really the last two or three years that we got to doing wireless offloads beyond just infrared, so um, and beyond kind of the amp plus stick scenario, but looking at Wi-Fi and Bluetooth smart to the phones and making that more universal and a lot easier for uh, consumers to get that data off of their watch. And I think that's where you start to see that connected watch um, take effect because you don't have to have anything special. You don't have to have a special dongle or um, some other complex hardware. You just have your phone and your watch or you have your watch and your Wi-Fi at your house. Around the same time in the last you know, three or four years, we started to see more smartwatches. Um, now, smartwatches aren't new. They started off um, kind of the, there's people who claim smartwatches started, you know, 30 plus years ago with the first um, digital watch. And I, I don't really see that as the case. I think what I define as a smartwatch is something that had some level of connectivity, something that could talk beyond itself. Um, and the first one of that was around 2000 by IBM, was actually a Linux watch. Um, and then since then, over the last 14 years or so, um, there has, actually hasn't been a lot of progress on smartwatches. We had kind of mostly silence, um, followed by occasional like cannonballs into the pool. Um, and then the, the manufacturer that was cannonballing the pool would subsequently drown pretty much right thereafter, right? And so you saw um, like the spot watch, for example, that, that lasted approximately one day, I think, on the market. Um, and so those sort of examples were things, they just, they weren't functional. They weren't what people wanted. They were, they were ugly. 
Um, that brought us all the way to about 2012. That's when we saw kind of a resurgence of smartwatches. Um, that was really sort of injected by uh, Pebble and by MetaWatch. Um, they're the ones that kind of kick things off quite a bit. Um, and I think in part because of Kickstarter. I think Kickstarter gave them that platform to go ahead and say, we can make a watch and we have an audience or a market for that watch. Whereas in the past, it may have been difficult to go ahead and justify that from a marketing standpoint and justify manufacturing of that. Um, the challenge with that, though, is that Kickstarter is, in a lot of cases, a, a geek-driven community. Um, and, and while Kickstarter does a lot more things than IT stuff, they do you know, film projects and whatnot, that those watches cater to the geek crowd. Um, so there's been a ton of smartwatches, but they haven't been terribly fashionable. Or if they were fashionable, they weren't terribly functional. Um, and so those that were functional weren't necessarily durable. They were slow, they were clunky, they were easy to use, and they, quite frankly, didn't do a lot. Um, so we saw that mostly kind of just um, circle around within that, that geek community. Lots and lots of options out there. Um, we started to see just in the last year, though, um, or even just last four months, um, some standardization there. And Android Wear was sort of that first example of potentially introducing standardization into that marketplace. Um, it's still way too soon to predict where Android Wear will go, but that's kind of that, that first start at saying maybe something isn't just a random vendor creating a watch that appeals to the geek community. Maybe it's something greater than that. And of course, to look at how many different watches there's been out there on smartwatches, this is per Wikipedia um, of list of official smartwatches. Um, so, you know, there are watches that are missing from this. Um, so, for example, they call it the Garmin Forerunner, but they don't call it the Phoenix. Um, even though the Phoenix has the same smartwatch capabilities as the Garmin um, Forerunner could, right? So, it's those sort of scenarios aren't quite as clear. Um, but this is just the beginning of this. And if you've gone to CES, um, you know that there are a million other smartwatches that are half as crappy as this that aren't on this list, um, that are no-name brands you've never heard of and they don't do a whole lot, um, but they're there. So I suspect most people in the room have probably heard of the ones on the left-hand side, and then the right-hand side are probably unknowns for the majority here. Um, and of course, you have players like Samsung who have been throwing things at the wall every three months or so um, from a smartwatch perspective. Um, and I suspect eventually that will stick. Is a Samsung person still in there? John, you still here? <laughs> I don't see John. Okay. Um, so, um, <laughs> but I think, you know, I don't think John works in that department, so it's all right. Um, from a, a smartwatch standpoint, uh, that's a bit of iteration, right? We're seeing a lot of iteration on Samsung's part, and some of that is making sense. Um, so we saw, for example, the uh, Gear Fit. That wasn't a pure watch, but more of a fitness band. Um, beautiful display, and, and people looked at that um, and said, if this thing works, it'll be awesome. Um, of course, the if this thing works part didn't quite work out. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of caveats to using that watch. Um, you look at the optical sensor and for heart rate, completely and totally useless. Um, so that starts to take away the fitness aspect of a watch that's named Gear Fit. Um, so I think those are, those are iterations and attempts that people have, have made. And it's all in the name of progress, right? I think you have to have those failures to, to move forward. Next, we start looking at fitness people doing watches. So you had all these essentially geeks sitting over here making smartwatches um, that were catered to the geek community. And then you had fitness manufacturers that started looking at smartwatches. And the first there was, was Motorola with the Moto Active. Um, and that was a watch that I think everyone in this room would agree with was way ahead of its time. And even by today's standards, it's still ahead of its time. Um, the display on that is still brilliant and beautiful looking at the watches that are out there today. Um, and they had a couple of, of minor problems. One was lack of waterproofing and then initial issues with battery. Um, and that sort of killed that watch in the marketplace before you get into the whole Google acquisition portion of it. Um, but that watch, I think if it, if it had been those two issues been you know, resolved up front, um, it may have made this room a completely different landscape than it is today um, because of the potential for that device. Um, and it's funny because that device was, I guess, now three years ago, I think, four years ago maybe. Um, and we haven't actually seen something that rivals that in, when you look at the functionality. So that measured steps. Um, it had you know, music control. It had music download. It had um, connectivity through phones. It had all these features that today we're just sort of coming full circle back to again. Um, so we started seeing after Motorola, um, Garmin got in the game with the, the Phoenix lineup, um, and there's a lot of different watches in that Phoenix lineup that are kind of have those smart notifications. Um, and now we have Sunto with the Amba 3. Um, Timex introduced a whole slew of products in the last little bit. Um, Solios, and, and there's others out there. These are kind of the, 
names that are most common for doing some sort of smart integration. Um, but all these integrations, at this point, from a quote smartwatch standpoint, are more about notifications. Um, they aren't about app development. So you look at Pebble, for example, and that's about putting apps on a watch, um, versus these are more about telling you something has happened. Um, and it's not right or wrong, it's just simply they're different potential landscapes. Um, now we're getting to the point, though, where you know, we may have that mesh. If you look at uh, Garmin with Connect IQ, we're starting to get the point of saying now we're going and adding, actually adding apps um, to those watches, plus the smart notifications, plus the fitness aspect. Um, so I think we're starting to slowly make those steps um, one piece at a time. Of course, then there's one company that decided to make all those steps at once, um, and that is Apple in the last few weeks here. Um, and it's funny because this has been, for this crowd probably, the most feared yet least understood watch out there. Um, there's been so much talk about what the Apple Watch could be over the last year or two that everyone assumed to be the worst possible thing for the watch uh, makers of the world today, whether that be fitness or be high-end watches. Um, but in a lot of ways, we actually don't know a whole lot about this watch. Um, you know, if you look at the, the Apple event, um, it's a very controlled media event. Having been on that side of those media events, they're, they're incredibly controlled as to what information you see and don't see. For example, those folks could not interact with the screen at all. It was purely just a, a slide of the screen, a slideshow essentially, um, showing you screens going by. So you don't know what the, the touch um, felt like. They didn't answer questions around waterproofing, so we don't know what that looks like. Um, though it sounds like at this point, it's officially not supposed to be used in the shower. Um, so if it's not used in the shower, then as you know in this room, that, that means it's probably not you know, any sort of IPX rating, um, which also means that if you look at sweat um, and fitness type activities, um, fitness will kill a watch, or sorry, sweat will kill a watch way faster than um, a shower will any day of the week. Um, it just takes a couple of days worth of sweat building up on the watch and get a nice little rainstorm in there, done. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what, what this watch looks like once it hits in the uh, early next time for, or early next year time frame, um, which is another point. We actually don't know exactly when, nor do we know how much it is beyond the base price. Um, so there's a lot of factors here that are, are somewhat unknown, um, which means that you may actually be better positioned than you think. Um, for example, if you're catering to Android customers, um, then you're perfectly fine because the Apple Watch requires an Apple device. Um, in the same way, conversely, that um, you know, Android Wear is requiring an Android device. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities for this crowd to be able to say, you know what, we're, we're device agnostic. We're on both sides of that fence. And we're potentially waterproof and all these other things that Apple may not be out of the box. Um, but of course, it's more than just a watch. And this is what's, what's challenging for this group here, um, is that in Apple's case, it's actually two different things. It's two platforms. It's a device platform. And then it's a, a web-connected web services platform is called HealthKit. And that's the core differentiator that, that it matters to this group here. Um, because it's one thing to develop apps, and Apple's really good at that. Um, and I don't think anybody in this room would, would disagree and say that people are going to develop beautiful apps for that device, no doubt. Um, the question is on the platform piece how they can integrate that and go ahead and ensure that that data gets right into HealthKit. If they do that, then it makes a just works ecosystem. There's nothing else the consumer has to do because they have the watch connecting to a platform and there's no need for those other, all, these, all these other portions or all these other pieces. Um, and what's interesting about that is that you talk to a lot of fitness manufacturers out there right now, a lot of fitness apps, and they're looking at HealthKit and they're looking at um, Google's equivalent and kind of wondering how they integrate, that, integrate into that. In a lot of ways, though, that's actually their competition. Um, so these platforms will be competing with Google Health or um, uh, Apple HealthKit and Google's equivalency and other ones that will come down the line. So how you, how you bridge that gap between the device and that platform is going to be the make it or break it kind of point for, for watches. Um, and so if you look at how you'll have to compete, um, first will be on hardware. Um, you know, we saw the slides earlier from CES, or from the CEA folks, um, on the study they did, um, and you're gonna have different areas you compete on. In this case, it's gonna be hardware, price, and platforms. It's gonna be your ability to create potentially better hardware, or at least hardware that's equal to it. Um, I know it's incredibly difficult to create better hardware than Apple on any device that you're looking at. Um, but then to look at how you can compete on price, which I think should be relatively easy for this crowd based on what um, Apple's been talking about price-wise, and then on the platform side. And this is the piece that'll be most challenging for this crowd. Um, so if you look at the Connect IQ um, announcement yesterday, that makes a great platform for the watch itself. Um, the challenge though there is getting that data to a platform. Um, so an app developer goes ahead and it puts data using Connect IQ into the watch, it goes in the fit file and the fit file goes off to 
Where? It goes off to somewhere. It doesn't go off to Garmin's own site that Garmin's going to process and display that data at this point. Um, so if I add Moxie into that, it won't go into Connect or Garmin Connect on that site. Um, down the road, potentially. Um, but that's an example where in, in Apple's case, that data is visible immediately. That data is visible in, in HealthKit and it's something that is shown right away. And that's a case where that platform will appear more smooth to them. Now, of course, in the case of, of Garmin, I'm not just picking on them. Well, I am just because they're here and they announced it yesterday. So um, in that case with Garmin, though, there's still many metrics that are Garmin specific in terms of run pace and heart rate and whatnot that are smooth to the user. They are um, normalized and they appear on Garmin Connect. Um, but you can see that the platforms aren't equal. So even though you're gathering that data on the device, it still has to have something that displays it beautifully somewhere else. Speaking of platforms, everyone wants a platform. Um, you know, every health and fitness app and device out there wants to own a platform. Um, and the problem with platforms is that they're, they're little islands. And so in this case, um, you know, communicating between different platforms is really complex. So you have you know, this, this poor guy here in the server room with all those cables. That's what platforms today look like. You have tons and tons of platforms out there and they don't necessarily align to what the consumers want. Um, consumers may want to put data in one platform for one thing and data in another platform for another thing. They may want to track um, weight data in one platform um, and then steps and calorie data um, with a different device. And how do they get that data into the same place? Um, so, you know, if you look at, um, to use Garmin as another example, um, in the case of Steps, they made a partnership with MyFitnessPal. Um, and that's great because, as noted earlier, MyFitnessPal is a huge leader um, in that space for, for weight management primarily and measuring um, calorie intake and, um, and calorie output and how, how you're expending that. Um, the challenge with that, though, is that people take the data from their Garmin device and it syncs up perfectly to MyFitnessPal and, and that's great, except what happens when they want to use a weight scale? What happens they want to use something that's a connected device in their home to measure the weight, which of course is central to what MyFitnessPal is doing? Um, for that, they have to go ahead and create additional partnership. So there's no way today for a Fitbit scale or a Withing scale, which are the two major scale partners out there, to get straight into Garmin Connect. So a user has to set up an account between Fitbit and MyFitnessPal, um, which then syncs the data there. And then from there, that data will actually back pour into Garmin Connect, um, which isn't well known, but it's one of those things that does actually work. Um, but it's an example of making life more difficult from the user's perspective. Um, and I recognize that it's very difficult to create partnerships with everyone. You can't simply sit there and say, we're going to partner with everyone on everything um, all the time. Because data has to be normalized. It has to be looked at and figured out, how do I take <coughs> data from one place and put it somewhere else um, and go ahead and do that across hundreds of different platforms out there. Um, so it's funny, you know, we talk about platforms. Platforms don't equal standardization. There's probably a mis a uh, misunderstanding of the market about that a little bit. Um, and I was talking with uh, Richard from Verve, um, they make the info crank, it's a power meter um, that's just come on the market. And, and he was talking about, you know, what is a standardized, what is something that's standardized? And in his mind, it's something that has 80% of the market. Um, so, you know, in here, the context of the conversation was around bottom brackets. And he was saying everyone has this new bottom bracket standard. Um, and of course, that bottom bracket standard for that particular bottom bracket was like 1% of the market. Um, but it's a standard because it's, it's new. Um, and the same thing is, is true when you look at platforms. Um, you've got to have some sort of standardization there to, to be able to gel things together, um, which gets into what is a platform. Um, you know, in this case, a platform is, is, in today's world, a place that users go to interact with something. Um, so if you have a Fitbit, you're going to the Fitbit platform on their site. If you have Garmin, you're going to the Garmin platform on their site. If you have Timex device, you're likely going to train it as a platform as a site. Um, it's also a place where users can drive social interaction to. Um, but it's about data. Behind the scenes, it's about data. It's about how data sits on those different islands. Um, and that's what it comes down to. Just like you're arranged in tables right now, um, somewhat by company, that same thing is true of, of uh, data for these different products, right? So the fact that a, a Garmin pile of data is different than a Timex pile of data um, on a platform perspective um, means it's more challenging for you to integrate this data back and forth between different um, different needs of the consumer, whether they want weight or, or steps or whatnot. Which gets to the last piece. There actually is no standard for step data, distance data, calories, or sleep data when it comes to activity trackers. 
Um, there really isn't. So there's a standard for how we record heart rate data. Um, you know, most of the room would use either FIT or TCX or um, HRM files, or kind of the big three in the world today. Um, maybe with the side of GPX um, with the HRM file or a heart rate file on the side of that. Um, but those are kind of the big three that everyone understands that. When it comes to step data, how do you transmit step data? How do you show that? How do you physically show that? And every single device does it differently, uh, which means it becomes really, really difficult to integrate. And the same is true for distance data as part of steps or calorie data, um, let alone talking about how you calculate calories. That's a whole different mess. Um, this is just how do you store calories based on the timeline of a day. Um, and then there's sleep data. Um, there's so many different ways to store sleep data and what comes with that sleep data depending on the device. Now, I'm not saying there's a solution for this. I'm not saying there should be a global standard for sleep data or for step data. That'd be great. But um, there are things to think about in terms of how you how you approach platforms. In other words, if you're looking at uh, looking at going into something, does it make sense to build your own platform and kind of reinvent this wheel, or does it make sense to see if you can latch onto someone else's platform? So that gets into standardization. Now, standardization is all about the just works factor, right? Does something just works? just works. Um, and in the case of consumers, despite what you think, consumers are buying your devices because they just work. If consumers find out your devices don't just work, they won't buy them. It's really that simple. Um, and, and it's not about you know, taking two devices and making them work together all the time. It's about devices individually just working and the devices working with other things they already have. Um, at a basic level, you know, in, in technology today, you have things like Bluetooth headsets and music. We all know that if I go to the airport and buy a Bluetooth headset on a little kiosk there, it'll probably work with my phone, it'll probably work with any other device out there. It just works, there's no confusion about that whatsoever. The same is true of a USB plug. I know that if I plug a USB you know, stick into my computer here, it's just gonna work um, every single time. I don't have to think about that. Um, and just like an SD card or a CF card for cameras, they just simply work. Um, now, of course, there's differences in quality, no doubt. Um, I can get you know, some SD cards that are crappy. Um, they may not have good throughput. Um, I can get some USB plugs that will have more amperage to them, you know, for something like the iPad, for example. Um, but by and large, at the base level, there's interoperability there, and they do work. So with that in mind, I'm going to cause some slight pain. Um, so my, when I was a little kid, my, my mom always said, you know, I clean my room, that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, so with kind of keep that in mind over the next few slides, that um, in order for things to get better, there has to be a bit of pain that goes along with that. Um, so to just kind of start things off, um, I've used this slide for the past five years I've been here, this single slide, um, is the core of standardization to think about um, over the next few minutes. Um, the first part is that there are file format standards and there are communication standards. Um, so whatever you're doing, you should be aligned to one of those two. Um, if you're going off and creating your own thing, then that's putting you in, in risky business, risky territory. Um, then there's three rules here. Number one, I don't care about excuses for not standardizing. I really don't. Um, for me, if I'm reviewing a device and it doesn't adhere to a standard that's out there that's available and that works, if there's no there's no excuses. Consumers, they don't care about excuses. I see that every single day. In the time that I'm sitting here up, or standing up here in this room talking to you, I will probably have three to five comments, just in this 45 minutes, about devices that don't work properly together um, in the sports and fitness world that people left on the site, just in the last hour. Um, that's how common this issue is becoming. And rule number three, refer to rules number one and two. Um, I've heard every excuse in the book about compatibility and you know, interoperability, and, but we're special and we're different and we've got a better idea, a better way of implementing it. I am sure that's the case. If you have a better way of implementing it, then take it to the respective communities, whether it be the Bluetooth SIG or the AMP Plus technical working groups to resolve those issues. Um, just simply you know, flipping a bid and making it work on your application or your device doesn't solve anything. It just, it just ticks off consumers. Um, so, before I do that, so before I go to the next slide, um, I realize I'm at the, the AMP Plus Symposium. Um, so, with that in mind, I'm, uh, I'm not showing something about Bluetooth Smart because I'm here. Um, and I'm going to show you something that's coming up in a review that will be posted, I think, on Monday, depending on um, how tired I am after my flights this weekend, um, around compatibility with the Suunto Ampa 3. Um, so, the Suunto Ampa 3 is a, a Bluetooth Smart. Um, only watch, they basically took the Soon to Amber 2, swapped out AMP Plus or Bluetooth Smart, um, and added a few little features and, and kind of called out the next version. Um, so while I will talk about Bluetooth Smart, keep in mind the door will swing both ways, about one slide later. Um, so it's not so much just focusing on one because I'm here. Um, so let's look at 
This is um, some testing I did this past weekend, um, focused on compatibility with Bluetooth smart accessories in the market uh, with the Ambit 3. And this isn't to blame Sunto or to blame you, because the reality is I think you are actually represented on this slide in this room here um, from an accessory standpoint. They're just incompatibilities. Um, the red ones are cases where it flat out does not work, meaning I can do something to either pair it, and that might work for a brief second, but when it comes to actually using the device, it functionally does not work. Orange are ones where there's some limitation there. Um, so those are cases where, you know, in the case of uh, four eyes with a heart rate um, and speed and cadence sensor, I can get the speed and cadence, but I can't get heart rate out of that data. Um, and there's others here as well, and um, I'll, I'll pick on Scotch briefly for a second just because we talked this morning. Um, they were actually read this morning, and then they came to me and, and we had talked last night uh, about how to get them to orange. Um, in the case of that, it's because of different firmware levels. Um, so if you had a Scotch device after August, um, then you were, you were good to go. If you had one before August, um, you were in red. Um, so those are examples of compatibility issues across the board. Now in the case of Scotch, is it Scotch's fault or is it Sunto's fault? I don't know. Um, I can take guesses at it, um, but I don't know, and at the end of the day, consumers don't care. All they know is they bought these two devices and they don't work together, and they're getting really frustrated with it. Um, so this is an example of where standardization isn't quite working. Um, it's not working because people aren't following standards, and they're not certifying against it. Um, and they're not going ahead and using the tools that are available to them to go and ensure their devices are compatible. Um, and this isn't just a Sunto Ambit 3. I saw the same thing with the, the Polar V800 also on Bluetooth Smart with accessories not being compatible. Um, and, and Polar kind of did a similar test to me um, and they actually went through and figured out every single device that wasn't compatible and why it broke. Um, and all but one of those devices followed the spec. Um, in their case, the only device that actually followed the spec, the only third party device that they tested that followed the spec was the Four Eyes Viva. Every single other device violated the spec in some way, shape, or form. Um, and now, it's tough for them because they got blamed for not being compatible. I mean, in this case, people looked at Polar and said, ah, it's Polar's problem. That's, that's the issue. And it, it wasn't necessarily in all those cases. So, let's talk about this room. Um, now, it goes both ways. I think there's pieces here that um, are causing consumers pain, and one of them is around adoption and creation of profiles. Um, I've talked about this somewhere recently online. Um, I think at this point that adoption of profiles are simply taking too long to get to market. Um, and what that means, though, is that people are looking at other choices. Um, so the trainer road or the trainer profile has been taking you know years. I know it's final, and we saw the presentation yesterday, and I, I really do understand that. Um, but at the end of the day, I can't actually buy a device or an app or anything in the market today that has that on it, um, despite discussions for years. So that's an area that it's tough to talk to consumers that really want that functionality. Consumers really, really want that, but it's not being used. Um, look at high-speed power data. This is a case where it's been talked about for years in this, in this forum around how we can do high-speed power data. Um, you know, Stages just went ahead and said, you know what, I'm just going to do this on Bluetooth Smart instead. And they, they went off and, and baked their own. Um, Pioneer, they did it with Private Ant. Um, these are opportunities for standardization. And it's not a case of having standardization on one platform or the other. I don't personally care if it's on Bluetooth Smart or Ant Plus. Um, what I care about is standardized in a way that consumers can, can take that information in and use it. Uh, which means that when you record the high speed data, then another application can go ahead and display it. It's true, there's no applications today that can display high speed data. But that's because there's no devices that can record it in a standardized way. It's a chicken and the egg scenario. You've got to start somewhere. Um, running dynamics. That's an area that you know Garmin introduced last year with um, the Forerunner 620. Has been other devices since then. Um, we have two kind of examples here. Scribe Labs was here. They pre they presented last year on some stuff. They demoed um, running on Amp Plus. They've since launched Kickstarter and are now doing full Bluetooth Smart. Um, purely because they couldn't get adoption of a profile that would support this for them and be mass marked across the board. Um, the Wahoo ticker um, is doing running dynamic like stuff again, um, all on Bluetooth Smart, not on not on Amp Plus, um, because there is not a standard there, because there's not adoption of that across the board. 
Cycling dynamics is another one that's just come up. You know, Garmin's introduced that for um, vector owners. That's an area that could bring a lot of clarity to a lot of metrics. I've talked to almost everyone in the power meter world here in this room over the last two years about the fact that different power meter metrics mean different things to different people. Um, so left-right power is left-right power on vector, but it's very different than it is on, on a quark or power to max because of the way you're inferring that. So um, they're different metrics. Cycling dynamics could potentially be a way to go ahead and look at that um, across the board for different things. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to clarify some of those metrics and to make them more open um, and make them more applicable to more people in the room. Uh, because ultimately, if these metrics aren't opened up to more, more of you in this room, you're likely going to choose other paths. You're going to do exactly what Stages did here um, and go towards their, kind of their own solution, uh, which doesn't really benefit anybody. So I guess, you know, you look at standards, and the thing is that I, I understand the concern around um, trying to get the standard right the first time. I understand why there was delays around the trainer profile, why there's delays around other things. Um, but I think it's important to understand that you don't have to boil the ocean at once. You don't have to solve every single item up front. Um, consumers actually don't necessarily want that. Um, in some ways, you can actually get more benefit from a consumer social media perspective by going ahead and doing things kind of iteratively and saying, look, we made a new upgrade to things. Um, I recognize that's more tough um, or tougher with, with profiles, um, but I think as long as they're interoperable, in this day and age, all of your devices in this room are upgradable over the air. Um, so you're at the point where it's very easy for you to upgrade firmware and upgrade software on the fly over the air, and that's all right. Um, we've seen you know, in the case of, of cycling metrics um, for power meter support, that's happened over the last three or four years, right? Different, different head units have gotten updates to be able to handle different portions of the, the power meter profile. Um, so I wouldn't be afraid of trying to get something out there quickly that, that you think is going to work, um, and then refining it later on um, because you have that capability to do that now. And then there's, you know, validating and certifying that you're your sensors are there with the respective tool sets. Whether you're using um, AMPLUS or BLE, and most of you are probably doing dual at this point, um, you should be validating on both sides that they meet the, the requirements of both those tool sets and they pass both tool sets. Um, you know, I kind of say you don't want to be the drunk uncle in the room, right? Um, so the drunk uncle is the one that goes around and um, has this, this sensor or whatnot that um, works most of the time and then berates everyone else because it doesn't work with their hardware and says, you know, ah, it's, I have the perfect sensor and you've got something wrong, right? As long as everyone's following the standard, then there isn't any drunk uncle moments because everyone knows what they're working off the same sheet of music there. So let's shift topics briefly and talk about carrier connection watches. Um, this is probably my little like pet thing in the world that I'd love to see is, is more direct carrier connected watches. These are watches that have 3G connectivity or some sort of cellular connectivity directly in them. Um, we've seen finally two devices actually hit the market this year and be available in people's hands. They can go out and buy them. In the case of Timex, it'll be probably a few more weeks away, but Bia is already there. Um, Bia is a women's focused watch, the triathlon watch. Um, it's got the watch portion that you see that left there, and it's got the little um, pod type thing um, that goes ahead and it uh, has a GPS portion in it. Um, that goes and allows you to uh, communicate via 3G networks around the world. So I've taken that thing all over the world and it works just fine. Um, and for women specifically, they like this because it has SOS type features in it, has the ability to go ahead and send out, you know, something's wrong, I need help. Um, and then in the case of the Timex watch, it has many of the same features plus a bunch more that kind of align more to traditional smartwatches. Um, and it's, it's more of a running only watch versus a triathlon watch. Um, so these are interesting devices because they start to sidestep issues. They sidestep platform issues. So instead of being tied to Android or iOS, they just work across the board. Um, so if somebody has a Windows phone or a Blackberry or something else random, um, that'll work just fine. Um, but it also gets away from issues that you're going to have around, you know, like an Apple Watch only working with Apple or a um, Android Wear smartwatch only working with Android. They are a deal for runners and triathletes um, because in those scenarios, those people don't typically want to wear something else on their body. They don't want to carry a cell phone with them that um, they has to transmit the location somewhere else. Um, for a cyclist alone, it's actually not that big of a deal because most cyclists will toss their cell phone in their back pocket anyways. So I don't really see it as a huge differentiator in the cycling market at this point in time. Um, 
What's interesting about these devices, though, in talking to, um, like I talked to the BIA folks about their stuff a little bit, um, is that they have a much, much higher adoption rate on firmware because of this. Um, they can keep all the devices almost at the exact same firmware level because it comes down from cellular networks and it's just immediately on the device. There's no pairing it with the phone and making sure the firmware comes down that way or, or Wi-Fi or USB or getting the user to do something. It literally just shows up on the screen and says, firmware's ready, are you ready to update? It's that simple. Um, so they can introduce features quickly and ensure that they're across the board. They can also introduce um, fixes very quickly as well. I do believe that ultimately, um, you know, some sort of SIM card based um, approach will be common for all these devices. Um, it's only natural. If you look at kind of where connectivity has gone over the last few years, uh, at this point, I think you're going to start to see carrier connectivity go straight to devices because it makes more sense. Um, there's, I don't see any reason if you look five or ten years from now um, for a watch to act and still be dependent on a cell phone. That just seems like an unnecessary tie on there. Um, especially if you're traveling a lot, it's nice that you don't have to worry about it. Both of these have um, international roaming agreements, so I can go anywhere in the world and not have to think about it, whereas my cell phone, I have to ensure that I have a, a roaming plan in that area. Of course, that does introduce complexities for you, I get that. Um, having those carrier um, roaming pieces aren't necessarily easy for you to negotiate. Um, you have to, to deal with a lot of complexities there also from um, certification standards. Um, so, you know, where you have a device that's certified to work in different countries because of those carrier pieces. Um, these devices also aren't perfect. So, you know, Timex will, will admit that straight up. They say that, you know, this watch is I think back, I guess it's not, um, is a bit bulky and they'll, they'll agree with that, um, that it's not perfect, it's their first, first attempt at this, um, and, but they also expect that to be a longer product line, that they expect to iterate quickly through hardware and see where they can go with, with direct connectivity. I need to go back. Um, they tend to be a bit bulkier, as we saw with the Timex, and in the case of BIA, you have to have a separate pod. Um, so that's something that's, that can be a turnoff to runners, um, especially, um, where they don't have to have all this extra junk on them. Um, and then you have to also, have, also have to balance the fee aspect of it. So how do you go ahead and have you know, an additional fee of X number of dollars per month that the user um, has to pay? And finding that right balance there can be tricky. Um, and then there's also issues of data run-up. Um, so you know you have a device that may go a bit awry, and now you you create a bill of ten thousand dollars in um, you know backwater China somewhere on a device that's not transmitting correctly. Um, and both of both of these companies will tell you entertaining stories about those sort of scenarios happening, where um, they look at a device that's just randomly communicating in a in a country where data is not cheap. Um, and so those are things that have to be um, have to be resolved. So a few other trends and thoughts that kind of go along with what I've talked about in, in years past, just sort of a, um, a potpourri of ideas, um, uh, different topic areas that I know many of you will, will ask me about and, and talk to me about. Um, first is power meters. Um, last year I said that, that was the year of the power um, and year of power meters. Um, I think I might have been wrong there. I think that's coming up soon um, because we look at the price point, it's just completely plummeted in the last well, I guess last four weeks or so, um, last six weeks, give or take. Um, and so I think, you know, while there's been a huge, um, uh, I guess, visibility of power meters in the last year, um, really dramatically increased, um, I think you're going to see adoption will start to dramatically increase beyond that. Um, that said, I still think that the conversation needs to shift a lot from watts to what do I do with this data. Um, if you get to the point where you're selling power meters for $399 or $299 or $199 or something at that level, um, you're attracting an entirely different segment of the market. Um, you're attracting people that um, don't necessarily know what to do with this and don't know how to train by it. Um, so. I wonder, for example, cycling dynamics is very interesting on, um, you know, from a, uh, I guess, academic standpoint. Um, but would it be more beneficial to potentially do something that's more around a, a power-based program that is on your device that makes it easy for you to understand power, easy for you to train by power, and it makes that completely uh, seamless of an experience for a person that buys a power meter for the first time and goes ahead and, and knows how to train with it. Um, and right now, I think there's a huge gap there. Um, and once that gap is solved, that will allow you to, to basically sell more units because it makes it easy. That allows you to target the middle of the pack and the back of the pack athletes that aren't up to date on you know, how to calculate their FTP and how to do that on a recurring basis. Um, and that allows them to make it easy to, to buy your products. Otherwise, they're going to simply say it's too complex. 
activity trackers. Um, so it's funny, when we were, earlier this morning, we were looking at the slides up there of um, wearable devices, and that, that talked about certain categories of wearable devices. Um, activity trackers is actually an area that's really it's become more complex as to what an activity tracker is. Um, you know, is a smartwatch that does activity tracking a smartwatch or is it an activity tracker? Um, is the, the Vivo Smart here, for example, is that an activity tracker or is it a smartwatch? Um, because by definition, two years ago, this would have been, if you looked at pure functional specs, would have been considered a smartwatch. It's, it's showing notifications, it allows you to interact with the screen, um, it allows you some, some control. That's a smartwatch. So the definition of what these things are is evolving very, very quickly. Um, it used to be the activity trackers did just you know steps, calorie, distance, and that's it. Um, now they're doing all sorts of crazy things. Now I can control action cameras with it. I can control, um, or I can pull data from cycling sensors into it. I can control my music. Tons and tons of stuff. Um, so the definition is changing. I, I have questions about the long-term viability of straight activity trackers. So if you look at something that just measures steps, calorie, distance, et cetera, I don't see that being a long-term tangible market um, because of phones and because of other devices. Um, people now can get that same step data um, and kind of calorie distance data from their phone, and by and large, it's just as accurate. Um, it doesn't necessarily work in you know, wet environments, but for the person that's spending $60 to $100 on activity tracker, they probably don't care about taking it into super wet environments like the pool. Um, instead, they're gonna say, I'm gonna save that money and just use one of the free apps out there that pulls data from one of the co-processors on the phone itself. Um, where I think there's a lot of opportunity, however, is adding all those additional features in. Um, you know, so in the case of me with the Vivo Smart, I would have said two or three weeks ago that I wouldn't have really cared about the smart notifications. I would have said, eh, didn't really matter to me. Now having used it for two or three weeks, it's actually kind of cool. Um, I actually sort of like the smart notifications and I actually use them more frequently than what I thought. Um, that's where I think that bridges into saying, now an activity tracker is more than just something I can get for my cell phone anyways. Now it's something that's providing me value above just step data. Um, and I use the step data as well, but it's sort of how you bridge that next layer there. Action cameras, um, huge explosion in growth about this over the last year. Um, of course, you've got GoPro is the, the major one in the world there, um, but there's a ton of newcomers to the market, um, and especially from companies, you've got, you got companies you've never heard of before that are entering action camera market. You've got companies that are traditional um, video type vendors like the Sonys of the world, um, and then you've got cell phone companies. And today, it was uh, sort of like pseudo leaked, not a leaked that um, HTC is entering the action camera market. Um, so there's an example of somebody from the, the phone side coming in. You have to wonder if HTC is there, how long until another phone vendor is right along behind with them? And then how long until Apple decides to get into that market or Google or someone else? Um, so these are areas where I think we'll continue to see a ton of churn in this market. Um, I actually don't believe that it's a GoPro only world. I know it's really easy to look at that and say GoPro is dominating the market, but when you look at how many new action cameras are coming on board at lower price points um, and delivering uh, far more features and far more capabilities, I think that's gonna to start to really fragment the market quite a bit more than, than people predict, um, especially with rumors of GoPro's new pricing for the new models going up $100. Um, so everything else is dropping in price and GoPro's gonna increase price. That could be, that could be really interesting um, for I think the rest of the market. Um, and then finally, I still think you know, the reuse of this data is complex. Um, it's still not easy to piece together videos. Um, I was you know, last night trying to get a a video piece together for a review I published this morning and I was trying to take um, video that I had recorded in one segment and video from another segment and then put them together and overlay the things so that the audio is talking about different portions of the video. It's still not clean and easy. I think there's a lot of potential there um, to go ahead and improve that experience for people. Um, it's one thing if you're doing that video week in and week out, you know, if you're like a YouTube star and do that every single week, then you've got that process down. Um, but for the rest of the world, um, outside of just doing kind of that single um, you know, pane of, of glass, you know, view of our recording activity, I upload it to YouTube and I'm done. Um, it's, it's difficult for the mass market to use that content. Um, though there's been some great advances in, in the editing tools that are freely available with the cameras um, over the last year. So last year I highlighted five products that, that excited me a bit. Um, so I figured I'd mention these five products before I go to the um, next slide where I talk about the five products for next year. Um, so I think I see some smirks in the room here. Um, so this is interesting for a few reasons. Um, the first, one, two, three, it's kind of complex actually. So the first product isn't out yet. Um, technically speaking, it's scheduled for December. So I could still be right. I could still like hit it on the 2014 timeframe because it'll be in December. Um, so SRM guy, where are you? You're here somewhere. 
Um, there you are. Don't let me down. You've got till December to get this out, otherwise I'll, I'll be wrong. Um, the M plus trainer profile, Elite is saying they're going to try to have something in place by the end of the year. So again, there's potential there for that to, that to still hit the, the, the hopes and dreams I had for it. Um, Recon Jet's looking a little more like January than December. Um, so that'll be interesting to kind of see where that goes from here. Um, I think, you know, we've seen kind of the Google Glass side of that story. Um, so you've got Recon Jet focusing on a wearable heads-up display target the sports market, and then you have Google Glass um, doing kind of the same sort of thing, but for non-sports activity. Um, I think we've seen a lot of the media and consumer interest in Google Glass somewhat taper off over the last, let's say, four to six months. Um, there's certainly lots of talk about it, but in, in terms of new development there, it's kind of been sort of quiet. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that over the next uh, four to six months. Um, Moxie, I think Moxie has found its home, um, especially over yesterday with uh, the Connect IQ announcements there. I think there's a lot of really cool, interesting potential for that technology. Um, in that same vein, I think uh, BSX as well is doing a lot of um, cool advancements there in terms of taking data that's not historically been captured and going ahead and um, finding new ways to use that data and improve training with that data. Um, and then lastly, the, the Forerunner 620 with Running Dynamics was on my list last year. Um, I love the watch itself. I'm not as um, convinced on what value Running Dynamics brings from a training perspective yet. Um, so I'm not convinced as to how I personally can use the Running Dynamics data day after day to actually make me faster. Um, and so that's a piece that I think has got some more potential to, um, to be solidified uh, long term. So looking next year, um, so I guess you know it's not so much specific products in this case as I think number one is smaller action cameras with sensors. Um, so action cameras have continued to get smaller, but I want to see those sensors stay in that when they get smaller. Um, we've seen a lot of companies introduce GPS and other sensors into the action cameras. Um, I want to just see that get smaller and smaller. Sony did a good job of that in dropping that action camera size in almost half um, in the release a few weeks ago. Um, I'd like to see more of that. Um, increased usage and accuracy of optical sensors. Um, I think actually accuracy of optical sensors for those that it works with is very good. I don't have of, of some of them on the market anyways. Um, I don't have a lot of problems with the, the units that I use. So if I primarily use units um, from Skosh and from Mio and uh, the technologies behind that are strong, but there are also a lot of sensors on the market today that just flat out suck, right? So you look at um, the sensors used in some of the other um, products out there today that are just really horrible, completely inaccurate. I can't even get a pulse sitting at a desk. Um, and, and for those that probably have followed my optical sensor reviews over time, I am probably the easiest person on this planet to get optical sensor to work with. Um, so if it doesn't work with me, you're probably really in trouble. Um, and there's other people that have more difficulty in getting sensors to work because of skin type or um, you know all sorts of other things. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more usage of that directly in watches as well as the accuracy that improving. Um, I'm really excited about the convergence of smartwatches and fitness watches. I, I think that's an area where you know we, we're starting to see that already, um, especially over the last three or four weeks. Um, and I think we're going to continue to see that um, over the next year. And that's an area that I'd like to be able to see that where that's it's just one watch. People can wear that one watch that does everything they want to do. Um, and and maybe that one watch will be the Apple Watch. Obviously, I'm excited to see what Apple will bring to the party. Um, I'm excited to see you know what they can do. I'm excited to see is there a sensor on the good side or is it on the the sucky side from an optical hardware rate recognition standpoint. Um, so those are areas that are all interesting to me. Um, and I think they should be interesting to the room as well, um, because it gives you potentially opportunity if they're on the sucky side. And it gives you opportunity to increase your um, offerings and your portfolio of products if they're on the great side to, to make products that are just as competitive with it. And then lastly, um, for a product that is in the room here, um, the, the Four Eyes Precision. I'm really excited about that because I think it's going to drop that floor in the, the power meter market um, if it's as accurate as, um, as they claim, and I hope it'll be by the time they, they release. So that's a product that I'm, I'm definitely excited about, and I'm seeing a huge amount of consumer excitement about, about that, but also about that price point. Um, so I think those are, those are areas that I'll be looking at over the next, uh, next year. So it kind of give you five big challenges um, that I think that you're going to have over the next year, things that I would focus on if I was in your shoes. Um, integration across platforms. I talked a lot about that earlier on. Um, a, lot of, a lot of work to still be done there. Um, device pricing versus phone solutions. I know that's something that you guys struggle with every single time you release a new product, is how do you market something that an app can do for $1.99 that your product you know, may cost $100 or $200 for. Um, so that's going to be, continue to be a challenge for you. Um, 
mobile OS adoption differences for connected devices. So the fancy, that's the fancy way of saying that sometimes you release devices that only support iOS and leave Android behind or vice versa. Um, that really frustrates consumers. Um, and people are really personal about that one. Um, it's funny, people will actually, they can deal with sensor incompatibilities, but people get really, really upset um, when they buy a device and it says it works on your smartphone and they find out it doesn't work on their smartphone because it's the wrong OS version. Um, so keep that in mind when you release products that makes you have very crystal clear timelines around you know, OS versions for smartphones. Um, and then of course, the Apple Watch will undoubtedly be a big challenge for this segment, um, both in perception as well as um, how it, what it brings to the market technically and from a product functional standpoint. So just to, to kind of wrap up with three quick slides on, um, for those that aren't familiar with how to, how to work with me, because um, I get a lot of questions on this. Um, I typically do two, two types of posts um, when I talk about products. I do first look um, and ha initial hands-on review posts. These are ones where um, I'm either at a trade show or an event like this, or I've only had the product for a couple days, um, where I'm looking just to kind of give people and readers uh, an awareness of what the product does. Um, so it has a lot of detail. Um, it has a, a whole lot of detail typically, but it's not something that I'm making a end judgment call on the device's success or failure at that point. Um, unless it's like completely horrible up front, I'm usually talking about where the device is going and what it's going to be by time it releases. Most of these devices in this first look section are ones that aren't yet available um, to consumers um, or may have just hit the market that day and um, I may not have a chance to play with beforehand. And then you've got in-depth reviews. So in-depth reviews um, kind of follow a, a pretty long cycle. Um, for me, there's you know, everything from the, the product arriving, um, and that's, that's also around making sure that that product fits my, my site. Um, and, and my general like, line in the sand, if you will, um, for whether a product makes sense to, to write about is that it has to be sports, fitness, or health kind of focused, um, and it has to have some sort of electronics component in it. So I'm not likely to, to review a pair of socks or a running shoe. Um, but if that socks or running shoe has some sort of electronic component into it, it's measuring something or whatnot, that could be interesting to me. Um, so that's something I may, may look at. Um, so when a product revives, there's un unboxing, there's initial use, and then there's a time period where I'm gonna use it for a long time to go ahead and, and kind of beat the crap out of it. Um, and this is important to consider if you're looking at having product reviews you know, on a given date or time down the road um, that you know, I, I don't do a review with the product arriving one day and the review comes out the next day. Um, the reviews take a long time to put together and I wanna make sure the product does what you say it's gonna do. Um, and then there's writing the post, you know, photos, content, um, and then finally publication. Um, now what's interesting about, about my site and publication and comments is that, as you'll see, there's a lot of people and there's a lot of people who leave a lot of comments. Um, they're asking questions about the product, um, they're, they're nitpicking about the product, um, and you know, that gives you an opportunity to interact with consumers potentially um, and to, to kind of bridge that, that social connection. I know many of you in this room do that. Um, you respond to, to, to comments um, on my posts and I can see the, um, the happy level, if you will, of consumers with your products is much, much higher than those companies that don't respond um, to comments on posts, um, which isn't trying to fragment you into to being in two different places at once. It's just kind of giving you perspective on, on that. Um, I know we had Nate and Reed from Trainer Road. Um, they released some an iOS app back at Interbike, um, and I think they've collectively responded to like 200 some odd comments since then. Um, a mind-boggling amount of comments. Um, but their users are incredibly happy, and they're, they're very, very um, thankful that they're working with them. Um, so with that, I think that's just about it. So I've, I've kind of talked through this already. Um, you can talk to me about NDA stuff ahead of time. That's not a problem at all. Um, I work under NDAs embargoes every day, so it's, that's not an issue. Um, and then, you know, for things that are ready to go, um, we can also talk about that as well. I don't, I don't have a, a problem with either, either scenario. Um, so I will be here until way early tomorrow morning. Um, so if you want to chat later on, happy to do that. Thank you very much.